Good morning, Wheaton College. It's a delight to be up here. Um, I love the Bible. Um, do you? Such good instruction uh, for us today. I want to start off, um, you know, m most preachers, when they come to the podium, pulpit, start with a compelling story to draw you in, right? The beautiful thing about a parable is you are the story. <clears throat> so here's what I want you to do. It'll be really brief, but I want you to see the poignancy of it. I'm going to have you just turn to a neighbor, and I want you to share your first, middle, and last name. And as I ask you to do this, there's a simple phrase I want you to articulate after you say this. So your neighbor's going to turn to you and say, what's your name? And you're going to reply, my name is Daniel Tyson Haas. And I am a subject of King Jesus. I want you to add that phrase to your name. And I am the subject of King Jesus. All right, if, you, if you're by yourself or you're not near somebody, I want you to say your name out loud and know that a holy God is listening. And reply to him. Or if you're just of the introversion nature. Uh, um, so take a moment. Turn to your neighbor and state your name. And after stating your name, first, middle, and last, also claim, I am a subject of King Jesus. Go. Okay, fellow, fellow subjects. The king is listening. The beauty for me of, of hearing that, almost 2,000 stories were just told. You are a, you are a living parable in this regard. Maybe the younger son, maybe the older son. I think the point I want to really make here is reality comes to you from beyond yourself. You were given a name, and you are the subject of a king. It kind of works both ways. There's a poetry here, right? He's curious about you. You're one of his subjects, which is in one way to say a servant of him, but also something that he deeply knows and desires to know even more fully. He runs out to you. We have a story today in the gospel. Um, it's a story about wrong wants being replaced with the right need. You, me, we're a jealous one. He is the jealous one. And I've titled, I've titled this sermon today, The Jealous One, playing off that reality of his jealousy. We are so lowercase. He is an uppercase Lord. Amen. The theme today is lost and found. We've sung about it already, tuned our hearts towards that direction. And the question is simple. Are you lost or are you found? 
the, the point of this message, which is kind of the point of the gospel, is repent. For the kingdom of God is near. So let me draw our attention to some context. As, as this chapter starts off, chapter 15, I think it's helpful for us to see where these stories are being told. As you turn to the first two verses of chapter 15 from Luke, it says this, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus' point in the stories that follow in this chapter is really to indict the Jews for their reaction to offer the kingdom of God to the Gentiles. Instead of being grateful for God's mercy, they're envious and angry. There's a jealousy. And so we go through these stories. There's a, a progression in rarity. We start with the one in comparison to the 100 sheep. And then one out of 10 coins. Yes, sir. And then one out of two sons, which really you could just say it's a one out of one when you get to that point. Because these two brothers, in a certain way, are the same. And then there's a hinge passage here in this text, which is verse 21. And the son said to him, this is the younger son, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called, to be called your son. But. And the father comes on the scene. Look at the theme here as we go through these, these, these stories that are told in regard to this context. Verse 7 of chapter 15, after the story of the lost sheep, concludes with this instruction. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Yes, sir. And then verse 10, at the conclusion of the parable of the lost coin. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then this story of the lost sons. Verse 24. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And in case you didn't hear it the first time, verse 32, to conclude the whole story of the chapter. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Two sons. Low down the younger and highbrow the elder. One father. The finder, the seeker, the celebrator, the entreater. A story of prodigal. Spending wastefully or spending lavishly as we see this prodigal God coming into this story to draw our attention to good news. Low down the younger He's sitting there in verse 1. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. Highbrow the elder and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Sons of Adam, daughters of Eve. Are you listening? There's a call on your heart, in your mind, for your very soul to repent, receive the forgiveness of the Father. 
both of these, the tax collectors and sinners, the Pharisees and the scribes, the younger or the older, are in need of the loving embrace of the Father. This is what this parable is drawing our attention to. The melody of this text is joy. That's the song that's being sung here. What is lost is found. A rebellious son and a jealous son and a welcoming father. I love this idea of of a jealous father. Jealousy with regard to God, says J.I. Packer, it's his holiness reacting to evil in a way that is morally right and precious. It's a praiseworthy zeal on his part to preserve something supremely precious. This is the God that searches for us, comes out to find us in the midst of our waywardness and our arrogance. Highbrow the elder is simply the inverse of lowbrow the younger. In verse 30, we get a picture from the perspective of this elder brother, of his younger brother. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes and killed the fattened calf, you, you killed the fattened calf for him. You can hear just the kind of a little bit of rage going on. This song of resentment that's being sung. There's sin in his posture. We see this in verse 28. He was angry and refused. Yes. Don't refuse the God who's reaching out and entreating you to come to him. I recall the prophet Ezekiel crying out and saying, these are the sins of your sister Sodom, and you're ready for all the debauchery of the younger son, right? No. You were arrogant, overfed, unconcerned, standing in a posture of refusal. This is the warning that comes from the elder brother Here's a Wheaton College story. Success grows into self-confidence, grows into self-righteousness. In every action, the result of the action is the reward. And it goes both ways. The award of wickedness is wickedness. The award of righteousness is righteousness. And I'll tell you this, sin is an absolute waste of time, literally. It is the worst use of time. We know this by experience. We come to shame through the folly of our misery. 1,500 years ago, Boethius, in his Consolation of Philosophy, said, you must understand that the wicked are all the more unhappy as their desires are fulfilled. The older brother is standing there saying, this isn't fair. And the father, in a more beautiful unfairness, entreats his son, comes running to him, and says, listen, it's good that we should celebrate. But he stands there with entitlement. It's this posture of, I deserve. I was thinking about this as it pertains to just maybe the questions that are even here in our own hearts and minds as we sit here today and seek to listen to this text. Maybe one of these questions resonates with you. What's the point of being faithful to Christ? 
I'm working so hard to be a good Christian. <laughs> Why does any of this matter? Does he, does he really see me? Where's my party? And why is the Father not coming to me? Here's another question. Would you really make yourself an orphan <laughs> by refusing his word? Because I tell you right now, he's been presented to us by the reading of his word this very morning. Yes, sir. He is here. Yes, sir. Because we've read his word aloud. And his word is his presence entreating us to listen and to follow. The invitation is to practice a gratitude over grievance. Resentment is a poison. And he stands angry and refusing to go in. Joy and resentment cannot coexist. Gratitude and resentment cannot coexist. And so what do we do? We learn to love the good. And the good is a loving father. You want to know what the good life is, Wheaton College? It's a love story with a holy God. Boethius again. In the hearts of the wise, there should be no room for hatred. Only a fool would hate good men. And as for the bad, there's no reason to hate them either. But we get so distracted. And we miss the point. Do you, do you see what's happening in this room right now? A space to come and hear from a holy God reveal himself to us in all his glory. I was thinking about this last semester. I'm often in this space. I've had more space probably on campus in this room than any other place. Been here for a quarter of a century. <laughs> Seen a few things. I wrote this poem titled A Multitude of Strangers. In chapel, Surrounded by an invincible army of angels and the students who take up the scroll of Instagram. I, I've seen it in this place. I've seen it in my own heart. We can miss the point while we're literally sitting in the celebration. You are here at the party right now. Don't miss it. Don't refuse it. He's calling out to you, asking you to fall in love. I was thinking about this, and the idea of kind of moving from sinning to singing came to mind. And this lyric rose, Sins of heart and of mind bears response to the divine. God of justice and of love reaches down to lift above our unrest into his rest when we learn we are blessed. Doxology of righteous praise with holy, holy, holy raised. Around the throne all creatures sing. Hail the glory of the king. And you know what? He comes down. He comes down to you. He gets close. He breaks rules. <laughs> he gets off the stage and says, come to me. Wheaton College, wake up. Are you listening? He's an entreating God who longs to be in relationship with you.
I mean, here's the, here's the key. It's fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he's found. The way into the rest of God is to revel and not rival. I think we should respond and worship.